Good morning, Jack. Do you have some time to talk to us about past performance? Sure. Come on in and have a seat. Thanks, Jack. I've just been appointed as a factor chair on a soon-to-begin source selection evaluation board, and my factor is past performance. Sergeant Chan here has been appointed as one of my evaluators. Neither one of us has any experience at all with evaluating past performance. I thought it would be a good idea to try to get a little education before we start. That is good thinking on your part, and I would be happy to help. Where do you want to start? Well, first, I'd like to understand why we even bother evaluating past performance. Think about what you do in your private life before you purchase something. You look in Consumer Reports magazine or on the internet. You ask your friends if they have purchased the same product or service and whether they were satisfied with it. If you are going to purchase any kind of service, such as plumbing, electrical, lawn care, or repair services, you ask for references that you can talk to about how satisfied they were with the services they received. Yes, I think we all do similar types of research before we make major purchases. Well, in a nutshell, that's all a past performance evaluation is. It's the government checking on offerer's references. The government is evaluating how well the offerer has done in the past in order to determine what bearing that prior performance has on what the offerer has proposed to do in the future. So this is essentially a risk assessment based upon prior performance? Yes. The evaluators use a mixture of fact-finding, reporting, verification, and professional judgment to assess the risk and predict the probability that the offeror will successfully perform the contract it is competing for. In other words, the purpose for using the past performance evaluation factor is to assess, based on a demonstrated record of performance, the level of confidence the government has in an offeror's ability to supply products and services that meet the user's needs. Is that correct? Yes, you have it exactly right. How do we go about doing such an evaluation? Well, obviously the first thing we have to do is collect information regarding the offeror's past performance record. How do we do that? Just like in the private life purchase example we were talking about before, the key to a past performance evaluation is good research and collection of relevant information regarding the offeror's demonstrated track record of performance. How do we know if the information is relevant? Relevancy is based on the similarity of the past performance to the type of effort to be performed under the contract being solicited and how recent the past performance is. To be relevant, the past performance must relate to work to be performed under the contract being solicited. The measures that establish the similarity and recency of the past performance should be uniquely tailored to each source selection and clearly set forth in the solicitation. Common measures would be things like a specific time period within which the past performance must have occurred, a generic description of what products or services would be considered similar, a specific level of complexity, dollar value, contract type, degree of subcontracting, or teaming that would be considered similar, and identification of particularly risky or unique scopes of work. Why is similarity so important? The more similar the past performance is to the work being solicited, the more relevant it is, and therefore the more influence it should have upon the performance confidence rating. For example, if the government is soliciting for the manufacture of fighter jets, we should not be spending time evaluating past contracts involving the manufacturer of clothing items. How well a contractor has manufactured clothing items has no relevance to the manufacturer of fighter jets and would be of no use in assessing risks and predicting probabilities of successful performance. Likewise, if the government is soliciting for lawn care services, we should not be spending time evaluating past contracts involving the delivery of accounting services or even the manufacture of lawn mowers. Neither of those two types of work is going to serve as a good indicator or predictor of success in providing lawn care services. Why is recency important, and how recent should the past contract effort be? A good rule of thumb 
and best business practice is to include only contract efforts performed within the last three years. Work efforts performed more than three years ago are generally not as effective and reliable as indicators of risk because so many circumstances and conditions can change for a business in the course of three years. Therefore, what happened four or five years ago is just not very relevant. Generally, the more recent an offeror's past contract effort is, the more effective and accurate it is as an indicator of the risks and probabilities of success in performing the contract being solicited. So all of this definition of what the government means by relevant should be in the solicitation, right? Yes. And the solicitation should tell the offerers what information to submit regarding each relevant contract. Normally, the solicitation will ask for information such as contract number, type, dollar value, place of performance, date of award, whether performance is ongoing or complete, extent of subcontracting, scope of work evidence establishing the relevance of the past performance contract, and, most importantly, the names, phone numbers, and email addresses of at least two points of contact for each contract. Why did you say, most importantly, with regard to the points of contract? Because my experience has taught me that it is by contacting these named individuals personally that you are going to be able to collect your most accurate, useful, and verifiable information regarding the offeror's past performance. This should include information about both positive and negative past performance, as well as any improvements made to correct the causes of the negative performance. Aren't there other sources of past performance information besides these named individuals? Absolutely. Besides the information provided by the offerers in their proposals, including any copies of quality awards, other sources of past performance information available to the evaluators would include the Past Performance Information Retrieval System, Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System, Electronic Subcontracting Reporting System, or other databases, interviews with program managers, contracting officers, and fee-determining officials, and the Defense Contract Management Agency. These are viable sources of useful information. However, to emphasize the automated information system rather than a tailored investigation by the evaluators may not be a wise choice. Historically, our best evaluations have used a multi-source approach, particularly given that some relevant contracts are not in these systems. I suggest that a better business practice is to emphasize the use of a specifically tailored questionnaire that can be sent to a point of contact to fill out, followed up by a telephone interview with the point of contact to investigate in more depth the answers that point of contact provided on the questionnaire. Or, in the interest of efficiency, you could accomplish the same in-depth investigation in one step by simply using the questionnaire as your telephone interview guide, rather than sending it to the point of contact to fill out and return. The key should be the detailed specifically tailored investigation done by the evaluators to obtain the most relevant information possible. This should always be supplemented by a check of the existing automated information databases to make sure no relevant information has been missed. This information should also take into account subcontractors and key personnel. Okay. Once we have gathered all this information about the offeror's prior contract performance, what do we do with it? Once the evaluator's investigation is complete, they should have a collection of factual, verifiable information regarding the strengths, weaknesses, and deficiencies of the offeror's past contractual efforts. This is what I like to call the raw data of your evaluation. It is now time for the evaluators and the factor chair to use their expertise to assess the performance risks indicated by this raw data and predict the probabilities of this offeror successfully performing the contract being solicited. The result of this assessment is the Performance Confidence Rating. It is a combined assessment of two aspects of past performance, the degree or level of relevancy of an offeror's past performance and the quality of that past performance. Is there some sort of formula for combining these two aspects to arrive at a performance confidence rating? No. 
This is where the evaluator's professional judgment must take over. Case law gives the contracting agency, and hence the evaluators, broad discretion in determining the relative merits of an offeror's past performance. The evaluator's judgment will be upheld as long as it is reasonable and consistent with the stated evaluation criteria and applicable statutes and regulations. Therefore, the evaluators and factor chair must use subjective judgment based upon the specific level of relevancy of the past performance and the expressly articulated quality of that prior performance to decide which one of the five performance confidence rating categories in the mandatory DOD source selection procedures is the appropriate rating to assign to each offer. I notice there is one rating category there called unknown or neutral. What is that all about? Carol, have you got a few minutes to help us? Sure, what do you need? Bill just asked about the neutral rating category in past performance. Can you explain why it is there? Sure. If you look at FAR 15.305A24, it states, in the case of an offerer without a record of relevant past performance or for whom information on past performance is not available, the offerer may not be evaluated favorably or unfavorably on past performance. When the language requiring the Department of Defense to evaluate past performance during source selections was added to the statutes and regulations in the early 1990s, there were several advocacy groups commenting on draft FAR rewrite language. These advocacy groups were afraid that this new past performance evaluation requirement would have the effect of preventing new companies or companies with no relevant past contracts from ever breaking into the DoD contracting business. In the end, the FAR Rewrite Committee included language in FAR Part 15 specifying that the lack of a past performance record not being evaluated favorably or unfavorably be included in the FAR. The unknown or neutral rating is the mechanism that the DOD has chosen to implement this FAR language. So if we assign a neutral rating to an offerer, how does that work when the SSA does the comparative assessment of proposals? That is a great question, and I have to tell you that the FAR Council has never issued any guidance to answer that question. Case law has not yet provided a clear answer to that question either. But based on my reading of the case law, I would suggest that the best practice would be the SSA to treat the neutral rating when compared to other competing offerors' ratings as if the proposal was rated in the middle of the four mandatory performance confidence ratings other than neutral. In other words, when compared to the performance confidence ratings of competing offerors, the neutral rating would be more advantageous than a low confidence rating or a no confidence rating but not as advantageous as a satisfactory confidence rating or a substantial confidence rating. Wow! Dealing with this neutral rating in the context of the comparative analysis the SSA and SSAC, if there is one, has to do to make the source selection decision appears to be a very difficult task. It definitely is a difficult thing to deal with, but it is required by law and regulation, so we must deal with it. But the good news is that the regulations have also given us a few ways to minimize the chances that we will have to use a neutral rating in any particular acquisition. Under FAR 15.305A23, if the offeror submitting the proposal has no relevant past performance, you can consider past performance from predecessors in interest. In other words, is the offeror a new company resulting from a merger? Or did the new company buy an experienced company? If so, you can consider the prior company's past performance. You can also consider the past performance of key personnel and the past performance of any subcontractors instead of concluding that there is no relevant past performance. It's good to know we have several techniques available to minimize the chances we will have to use the neutral rating for performance confidence. I'd also like to mention a couple other lessons I've learned over the years about using past performance as an evaluation factor. First, you must try to make sure that the people assigned to do this evaluation 
possess four basic qualifications. They must be people who, A, have a detective mentality because answers are hard to find, B, have a good phone presence because they must be able to deal with a lot of different people while obtaining information, C, are comfortable and willing to make judgments based on a lot of potentially conflicting information, and D, have good analytical and good writing skills. Good advice. I think the sergeant and I measure up. My second lesson learned is to allow sufficient time to complete the past performance evaluation. Usually a lot of time is needed to get responses from the points of contact and gather all the relevant information. A best business practice can often help with this long pull on the 10 aspect of evaluating past performance is to request in the solicitation that the offerers send in the called for past performance references at a specified date prior to the closing date for submission of the rest of their proposal. For example, I have often suggested that submission of the past performance references be requested two or three weeks prior to the closing date for submission of the rest of the proposal. This gives the past performance evaluators a head start on the rest of the source selection evaluation board and hopefully will allow them to complete their work at the same time as the rest of the source selection evaluation board. That's a good tip. Thanks. And remember, just as in your private life, if done correctly, using past performance as an evaluation factor can be a very meaningful discriminator among competing offerers. Thank you both. This has been a very helpful discussion. Sergeant Chan and I have a much better idea of what lies ahead of us and how to cope with it. Wait, before you leave, I have a question. Jack, have you discussed with Bill and Sergeant Chan how the evaluation of past performance has a dual purpose under the FAR? No, I didn't. I think we should talk about that a little before we break. What do you mean by dual purpose? If you look at FAR 9.104-1, you will see that past performance must be considered by the contracting officer as part of the determination of a prospective contractor's responsibility. A determination of responsibility is a prerequisite to every award, competitive or non-competitive, sealed bid under FAR Part 14 or negotiation under FAR Part 15. But if you look at FAR 15.304C3, you will see that past performance is required to be used as an evaluation factor in competitive negotiated acquisitions exceeding the simplified acquisition threshold. Unless the contracting officer documents the reason past performance is not an appropriate evaluation factor, for the acquisition. I must also point out that the Director of Defense Procurement, through the issuance of a series of class deviations, has set different thresholds for when past performance evaluations are required. So for the DOD, the thresholds for requiring past performance evaluation factors are $5 million for systems acquisitions and operations support acquisitions, $1 million for services acquisitions and information technology acquisitions, $500,000 for ship repair and overhaul acquisitions, and the simplified acquisition threshold for all other acquisitions. The exception allowing the contracting officer to document the reason past performance is not an appropriate evaluation factor still applies to these deviations. So the FAR requires past performance to be used both as an eligibility prerequisite for every award in any acquisition. In other words, part of the responsibility determination and as an evaluation factor for source selection in competitive negotiated acquisitions. However, I must caution you to keep in mind that the use of past performance as an evaluation factor is very different from the use of past performance as part of determining a prospective contractor's responsibility. The function of a responsibility determination is to assess whether or not the prospective contractor has the minimum level of competency and capability necessary to perform the contract. This is simply a yes or no decision, and a no will act as an absolute barrier to award. 
This assessment and determination of responsibility is done by the contracting officer after the proposal evaluation and source selection process is completed and is applied only to the winning offerer. So the evaluation of past performance for the purpose of determining responsibility is something the contracting officer does. It is not something the Source Selection Evaluation Board does, right? That's correct. So how is what the Source Selection Board does with past performance different from what the contracting officer does? When using past performance as an evaluation factor, the Source Selection Evaluation Board examines the offeror's record of performance on similar contract efforts. The evaluators apply a mixture of fact-finding, reporting, verification, and professional judgment to assess the risks and predict the probability the offerer will successfully perform the contract being solicited. These evaluated risks and probabilities are then compared against the evaluated risks and probabilities present in the other competing proposals as part of the Source Selection Authority's trade-off decision of which proposal offers the best value to the government. To summarize the difference between these two uses of past performance evaluation, the responsibility determination is an absolute approach, while the evaluation factor is a relative assessment. In other words, a negative responsibility determination based on the past performance would make an offerer ineligible for award, whereas an offerer is never ineligible for award as a result of a negative past performance assessment. A negative assessment under past performance is not a deficiency, but rather is just one aspect considered by the SSA when making a trade-off decision. So it's sort of like the difference between using a past performance evaluation in a pass-fail type grading system and using a past performance evaluation in an A to F type grading system. Is that right? Yes, that's a pretty good analogy. And that's an excellent high note to end our conversation on. Thanks again to both of you for the education. 